So, so this is the example we did in class. And uh, we did that uh, using two different methods. We did it using what you learned in solid mechanics. And then uh, after that, we said we are going to work this example uh, using the finite element method. And we started meshing and writing the element stiffness matrices. We assembled the global stiffness matrix. And uh, we uh, wrote, when we wrote the global stiffness equations, we applied the boundary conditions that allowed us, when we applied the boundary condition, we were able to uh, solve for the unknowns. We found U2 and we find RC and we find RA. And then after that, we use the element stiffness equations, use the element stiffness equations to find the normal forces. So today we would like to go back to our original problem and solve this problem using ANSYS workbench. ANSYS workbench. So when uh, we look at this problem, the first thing we want to ask ourselves is what kind of elements would be adequate? We're going to keep it very simple, similar to what we did by hand. So when we work this problem by hand, we decided that these two pieces or two cylinders are axially loaded. And we used a spring or a bar element to model spring or bar element to, mo to model each of them. And uh, as I mentioned last Thursday, the beam element in ANSYS Workbench is capable to you model an axially loaded element or loaded in torsion or loading in bending. So we are simply going to use beam elements in ANSYS Workbench. So when I want to create the geometry, I'm not going to worry about creating a 3D CAD model. I'm simply going to create two lines to represent A, B, and B, C. And I'm going to define or assign a cross section to each of these lines, as well as material properties. So it is important to know what we are doing here. So we have these uh, two pieces fixed at A, B, was free to move. And then at C, we had this wall. And we know that there is a gap between the wall and the C. And uh, this gap or distance or displacement was equal to 0 0.002 inches. We know the material property was given E as 10 times 10 to the power 6 PSI. And uh, we were given the area of AB and the area of BC. I can use that to find the radius of AB and the radius of BC. Because remember, these are cylinders, so they are going to have a circular cross section, and I just need to find the radius. 
So finding the radius, knowing that this was 0 0.10 square inch, I can uh, use pi r squared and find the radius to be 0.178412 inch. And the radius for BC is 0.2 one eight five one inch. So in the finite element method, the first thing is to discretize. And in order to discretize, I have to decide on the element. So in ANSYS workbench, I'm gonna use beam elements and when I mention here beam elements I want to remember that I'm going to use the line concept in other words I'm creating a 1d geometry just lines. And then when we do the 1D ge geometry, we're also going to define cross sections. One for AB and one for BC. So we want to know what we're going to be doing once I launch ANSYS workbench. We're going to define the material. And then I'm going to create two lines, one to represent AB and one to represent BC. So this is what I mean by 1D geometry. We're just simply creating lines. And these are oriented along the x-axis. I'm going to keep my vertical as my y-axis. Another thing to keep in mind when we are using ANSYS Workbench, we are working in space in 3D. So I have X, Y, but I also have a Z. So these are my lines or my geometry. And uh, if I wanna define my points now, I'm gonna look at point A, and this will have coordinates of zero, zero, and zero, right? And uh, point B, if I look at the dimension, AB was 10 inches long and BC was 12 inches long. So point B is gonna have coordinates 12, zero, and zero. Right. Question, can I see the red? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, thank you, <laughs> yes. And uh, point C would be 10 plus 12, 22, zero, and zero. So this is the geometry part. So we can start here. So I would like you all to launch with me ANSYS Workbench, and we're gonna take it one step at a time. Uh, I will start by workbench, define my material, pro material properties. We're gonna go to the geometry, make sure not to double click, but right click to choose design modeler. So we're gonna go to ANSYS. 
all the way down to workbench 2020 R2. Please remember before I get started, I wanna make sure to check my units and make sure I'm using US engineering units. And we wanna do that for workbench, for design modeler, we wanna use inches and also for mechanical. So here comes my workbench. I'm gonna look at my units and the default here is going to metric. I'm gonna change that to US engineering. And I also wanna make sure to display values in project units. So I'm gonna create a new project. So I'm gonna go file. And I'm gonna go save as and I'm gonna choose my folder. So 2021 fall, I'm gonna put axially loaded class example using beams. And I'm gonna save. So that will give my uh, project a name. I did not create yet a WBPZ. We can do that at the end. First step, I'm going to define my analysis system or choose my analysis system. So I'm gonna use static structure. I'm gonna double click. It's gonna show on the project schematic I have a static structure analysis system. So cell number one, tell me what kind of analysis system that is. Cell number two has the engineering data. There is a check mark because there is default material, but we wanna create our own material. So I'm gonna go to engineering data and I have structure steel. I'm gonna, under structure steel, there is this white cell. I'm gonna go to it to add new material and I'm gonna call the new material class example. Enter. You see there is the question mark next to it. I need to define what type of material behavior do I have for class example. So I'm gonna go to linear elastic and double click on isotropic elasticity. Oops. Uh, want to make sure class example is selected and then isotropic elasticity. And uh, here, if I expand, I see the two material properties for linear elastic that I need to input. So the first one is the Young's modulus of elasticity. So I can put 10 e to the six or one e to the seven, same thing, right? 10 e to the six. Oops. And for Poisson's ratio, as we agreed, we are gonna simply use a 0.3. Uh, in this example, everything is happening along the X axis. So Poisson's ratio really would not have an impact but it is required to input a Poisson's ratio, a 0.3. Is the screen uh, clear or would you like me to try to change the uh, zoom in a bit? You can all see, okay. So now this takes care of my class example material property. Uh, 0.3. Yeah. 
So this is, I'm looking here at the engineering data tab, uh, uh, tab I can toggle back to my project. Next, we're gonna go to the geometry. So I'm go to cell three and I'm gonna right click to make sure I don't launch the default space claim, but rather a new design modeler geometry. It is starting design modeler, starting design modeler. So here comes design modeler. I can turn on my default planes so I can see the X, Y, Y, Z, and Z, X. You said you right click the geometry tab? Correct, right click on it. And then I choose, of course, now I just started it. But when you right click on it, you wanna choose the second option, which is design modeler. And uh, if you look at the icons at the bottom here, I can go back and forth between my workbench and design modeler. DM. So now we are ready to create our geometry using design modeler. So just to remind you here, Here is the geometry that we wanna use design modeler to create. So I'm gonna go back to design modeler. And I'm gonna start by creating my three points. So I'm gonna to go to create point and we wanna make sure that when we are look at looking at the details view of the point that I choose manual inputs. And looking here at the units, I still did not change the default, which is metric. So I wanna change my units from meters to inches. So I'm gonna to go to units. And since I'm in the middle of creating a point, it's not allowing me. So I see all my units grade because I'm in the middle of creating a point. The good news for the first point, it's three zeros anyways. So it's not gonna be affected by the unit. So I'm gonna accept this step. And uh, by the way, I can come here and call my point A. So I go generate. And here is my first point created. And I can uh, select the Z axis to look at the X, Y plane. I can uh, also, oops, 
choose to zoom in where I expect uh, my part to be. So I did the right click and select the area. Now my units are still in meter. I'm going to go units. And you can see now they're no longer grayed out. So I can select inches. We're looking at 700 inches, which is too much. So I can uh, zoom in 100 inches. I'm only looking at 22. OK, this is uh, better. I'm going to go create. And I'm going to select point again to create point B. So now I'm going to be creating point B. And we're going to define it using coordinates. So I'm going to go manual input. And for the X, I'm going to put 10 inches. Generate. Here comes point B. Next, we're going to create point C. So we're going to call it C. And manual input. And now I have 22, 0, and 0. Generate. Here is my third point. I will zoom in on these three points, A, B, and C. And now we are ready to create our line concepts that are going to be meshed with beam elements. So I'm going to go to concept. I'm going to do lines from points. If you check carefully on the tree outline, right now we have zero parts, zero bodies. When I create a line concept, it's going to be considered a body that makes a part. We want two of them. And we want to make sure we can define two different cross sections. So when I go create line from points, you look at the detail view. It's prompting me to define my point segments. And also, it says here the operation that we're doing is we're adding material. There is add material and there is add frozen. If you are building one body, after you create the first one, you're just going to use add material and keep adding to the body. But if you want to have multiple bodies, as is in the case here, where we want to have two different bodies because each body is going to have its own cross section. So we really have two cylinders that are connected. So we want to make sure we have two distinct bodies that make one part. So this is something to keep in mind, and I'm going to show you how to do it. So on the first one, I'm going to go with add material, and this is going to be AB. So this is the segment AB. I want to go to my point segments, and I'm going to select the first point, which is point A. Uh, so now it should allow me to select my points, which is not uh, so. I want to check, and I see here that selection filter is set to points, and we have points. So 
district. I'm, I'm just gonna cancel this. Okay, let me just uh, redefine this line segment. You don't have to do that if you can select a point. I'm just gonna go to concept line from points and I'm gonna call it AB. I'm gonna go to point segments. Should be working for uh, all of you, right? Okay, so mine is the only one that's giving me hard time here. Select peers. Okay, here we go. So it was set on box select rather than single select. That was it was not allowing me to select my points. But now I can uh, come back and select my first point. Control. I press Control and another left select to select my second point, and I apply. And here is my A B that is not generated yet. So it's showing me where AB is gonna be. I like it, I click generate. And now I added one body that makes my part. Now, uh, if I go to line body, I do not have a section assigned to it. So we can define the sections later on. Let's now continue with the second line, another line from points, and I'm gonna call it BC. Point segments, I'm gonna select my first point. Control, select my second point, apply. Looking carefully at the detail view, it says add material. And I wanna show you what this is gonna do. If I click generate, I ended up with one continuous line body that makes my part. So yes, I have two lines defined, but I have one body. They're considered to be one body. Why? Because I left it at add material. If I keep it at that, I will not be able to define two different cross sections. So how do I fix it? I wanna come here and change at frozen rather than add material. And now let me generate my line concept. And please pay attention to what's gonna happen here. When I click generate, now I have two bodies where I can go to each line body and define a cross section. However, because I made two bodies, they're being treated as two different parts. So they're not necessarily connected. So I have to make sure to let ANSYS know that these two bodies make one part. How do I do that? And uh, let me be specific here and call this line body AB. And this one, I'm gonna call it line body BC. So you can see I define the names as I wish. So I'm gonna take these two line bodies, I select them and I right click and say, form a new part. So I'm gonna use these two bodies to make one new part. 
when I select form new parts, I still have my two line bodies, but this, they now make one part. Okay. Next, we are gonna go back to concepts and go to cross sections. And I wanna create two circular sections. So my first circular section here, I'm gonna call it circular AB. And I'm gonna give it a radius of uh, 0.178412. So I'm gonna come here and go 0.178412. And uh, as I input my radius, I can look at the detail view of my circular section AB, and it's showing the properties of the section. Initially, it was starting with one. So you see the area is pi. If I enter my new radius and click enter, the area now is 0.1 inch squared, which is what we wanted to make sure we are solving the same problem we did by hand. I'm gonna go to concept again and go to cross section, create my second circular section that we are gonna call it circular BC. And I'm gonna give it a radius of 0.21851. Enter, look at my properties. My area is a perfect 0.15 square inch. So yes, I created the sections, but I didn't tell answers where each section is going to go. The names do not mean anything, but I need to go to the line body AB and attach to it a cross section, which is circular AB. I wanna to go to line body BC and define its cross section as circular BC. So now my two line bodies have sections assigned to them. If you right click on the line body, you can choose select an aligned line edge and play with the alignment. But do we need to change anything about the alignment? We have a circular cross section. So it really doesn't matter. So I don't have to mess with the alignment today like we did in the class example on Thursday, last Thursday. So now the geometry is completed. I can come here and save my project. If I go to workbench, it's updating. And now my geometry is done. I have a check mark. I'm ready to move on to the next step, which is gonna launch for us ANSYS Mechanical. So I'm gonna double click on model and it says here, starting mechanical. So here comes mechanical. I want to make sure that my units are set properly. So I'm going to go to units and I want to select US customary, the one that has the inches. I want to make sure we have consistent units.
I'm going to go to my geometry. And here comes the geometry. If I select the Z axis, we have the line. And let me just change the background color so you can better see my screen. So now you can see my line, but you do not see the vertices. So I can go to display and make sure to turn on show vertices. If I expand my geometry, I have one part made out of two line bodies, AB and BC. If I look at material, I have class example and structure steel. Now I want to make sure that my part has the proper material assigned to it. So if I go to the part, look at the assignment, it says structural steel. If I go with the default, I will be solving a different problem. So I wanna make sure to come here and change the material from structure steel to the class example material. So I select here class example. Please note that if these two line bodies have two different materials, I could have assigned the material properties to the line body rather than to the part. But when I change it to the part, inherently it gave it to the two line bodies, AB and BC. So now I have geometry, proper complete geometry, which by the way, I can come here and say display the cross sections. And look at this, it's like rendering. It is showing A, B, and B, C. It is basically putting a section on the line so I can have some visualization. But my geometry is 1D, I only have lines. So I'm gonna turn this back off. We have geometry, we have materials, we're ready to discretize, to create a mesh. So my next step is to go to the mesh. And uh, if I look at my uh, menu, I can go to the context basing, based on what I'm choosing here. And uh, I can uh, choose the solver Sorry, I can choose to generate a mesh. I can select generate, or I can come to the mesh and right click and say generate mesh. It's the same thing. So when I say generate mesh, because I have line concepts, I am telling ANSYS that I am using beam elements to mesh my part. When we did this by hand, it was sufficient to use two beam elements because we know that there was nothing happening between AB and between BC. So two elements were sufficient. But ANSYS Workbench does not know how we're gonna load this. So it automatically put this mesh that had more number of elements than, how, than when we did it by hand. So it's using a finer mesh. Now I have a mesh, but we do not have a static structure set up and we do not have a solution. In order to set up our system, we need to define the boundary condition and the loading. So I go here to static structure and I wanna apply my loads. 
let me go back to the geometry or rather the display and i want to turn off thick shells and beams and also show mesh so i'm just showing my geometry because i can apply my loads and constraints to the geometry and not to the mesh so i'm going to go to static structure And I want to make sure I'm looking at the environment here. So I'm going to go to loads. And we are going to apply a force. So next to loads, there is a force and there is a moment, the most common. So I'm going to select a force. And we want to apply this force to point B. So under the details of a force, it's prompting me to select a geometry. So I wanna come here and please note that I can mistakenly select an edge. So we wanna make sure that I'm selecting a vertex. So we are selecting point B and I go apply. So this is where my force is going to go. If you recall the problem, we had a one kip force applied at B going from the left to the right. So I'm going to define my force using components. So it says here type the force defined by, and instead of a vector, I'm going to say components. And I'm going to apply a force along the x axis of 1000 pound force for one kip. And here is an icon to show that there is the, the proper direction of the force. So we have a force, but we do not have boundary conditions or constraints. So the next step, I'm going to go to my supports. But specifically, we know that point A is fixed. And uh, right next to supports, there is fix. So I'm going to select fix. And I'm going to apply this fixed support to point A. So I go A and apply. Here comes my fixed support. Based on our estimation, we found that point C is also going to move all the way until it hits the wall. So it's going to move a point zero zero two inches right so i'm gonna assign and this is considered a support pre-described displacement so you see fixed frictionless and then there is displacement so i'm gonna select a displacement and apply a displacement to point c so i go apply and then it is free to move in the y and z but in the x i have an x component that we already know which is 0 0.002 inches so we defined fixed support prescribed displacement and the applied load of one kip before I run a solution, I can go back to my static structure and use this opportunity to review my static structure setup to make sure I have applied the force and the constraints as desired. Where do you store the um... I just moved to Here is displacement. Oh, right. And uh, this is what's going to look like. So detailed of displacement, I'm showing it now. I selected point C. And I defined the components. So it is free to move in the Y, free to move in the Z. But in the x direction, it is gonna, just going to move 0 0.002 inches. So 
So these are defined, the analysis settings. So I am uh, still working on cell five. If I go to workbench, we have a model because we created the mesh. The setup here and the solution are going to be completed when I run or solve this problem. So if I click solve or F5, is creating a solver input file. So basically, this is where it calculates the element stiffness matrices, assemble the global stiffness matrix, apply the boundary condition, and see whether there is a solution or not. It can solve for the unknowns, but I really do not see any numbers. So it's building the mathematical model, solving the mathematical model. And now I get a check mark for A5 and A6, but I do not have any results to look at. I have a, a solution information like reports. I don't think you want to read that. Uh, but there are some useful information. It uh, shows here the type of element being used and it's called beam 188 and uh, it created 10 and 11. So 21 elements were created. The number of equations, 251, because it had 21 elements. We only had two elements. So I want to go back and start defining the results that we are going to look at. So when I go to solution, so you look at the top under my menu, under context, there is solution because I selected solution from my outline. The first thing I like to look at is how my part is going to deform. Is it really capturing the behavior I expect or not? So I'm going to go to results and choose deformation. And I'm going to say total deformation. And I'm going to solve for that. Okay, I want to better visualize it. I see here like color plot. Clearly the dark blue is zero. The red is moving. And uh, please note that all the numbers are positive. All the numbers are positive because we're expecting everything. First of all, it's total deformation. If I even look at directional deformation, Everything is going to be positive because everything is moving in the positive X direction. I can better look at it by playing an animation. To see what's going on. I can uh, change the speed or the number of frames. So this is doing what I expect. Everything is happening along the X axis. Now we are ready. We are comfortable, confident in uh, our solution. And we want to look at the desired results. So this problem asked us to find the war reactions, displacement of B, and the internal forces or stresses within AB and BC. And I would like to show you how we're going to achieve that. So I'm going to go back to solution. And I'm going to start by looking at support or war reactions. And I'm going to go to probe. And I can calculate a force reaction. And it's prompting me here when I look at the details of force reaction. It's prompting me about where do I want to calculate the reaction? Is it at the fixed support or displacement or a weak spring? And we want to do it. We want to find the reaction at A. So that's going to be fixed support. 
and I can call this force reaction at A. Uh, we can come here and uh, rename it to force reaction at A. So from the tree outline, I can rename it. Now we did use a fixed support and a fixed support prevents rotation. Are we expecting any rotation here? No. Just to double check, let me come here and create a moment reaction. And of course, moment reaction has to be at the fixed support. And I'm gonna call this the moment reaction at A. Again, we should expect to get, or we expect to get a zero. Next, we wanna find the wall reaction at C. So I go force reaction and this time I pick displacement because we defined the displacement here. See, it's showing where this force reaction is gonna be calculated. I rename this as force reaction at C. So we have defined the wall reactions. Next, I want to look displacement specifically at B. So I'm gonna put a probe and I'm gonna select the deformation and the details of the deformation probe is prompting me to select a geometry. I wanna select point B and be careful again when you're selecting, especially if uh, you have the smart select on. So you wanna make sure you are selecting specifically point B. I go apply and it's asking me result selection. I can do Y axis, X axis, Y axis, Z axis, or the total. These are the components of displacements. Now, what do you expect the total to be? So I'm gonna select here total, but the total should be the same as the X axis. I should not be getting any Y or Z components. So this deformation probe, I'm gonna rename it and say deformation probe at B. So that's the displacement at B. We're good so far? Okay. We also wanted to find the axial forces in AB and in BC. Let's see. So I selected a probe. I selected force reaction. It's prompting me to define the geometry, uh, sorry, the boundary condition. So I picked displacement. You got it? So next, we want to look at the axial forces. So when I go to the beam results, I can plot an axial force diagram, or rather distribution. I can also do a bending moment. Now we really don't expect any, but let's do it. I can also do torsional moment, it should be zero. I can also do a shear force. And as I showed you last time, we can also do shear and moment diagrams, but we need to define a path. We're not worried about shear and moment diagrams. So let's leave it at that. And uh, let's solve to evaluate all these results that we have defined. So I'm gonna go solve. You see, it didn't take a second. And now I'm gonna go and check my reactions first. So force reaction at A, when I look at my results, 
I'm getting 555.47. When we did it by hand, we got 555.55. Remember, this is a numerical method. So we do expect some percentage error, but it is extremely small for such a simple problem. And you look at the direction, it is going in the negative X direction. So here it's showing the components and the total. The moment reaction at A is zero. That's very good. So we know that we did not accidentally create any bending. The force reaction at C is 444.53. And you see all the forces are going in the negative X direction to support the one force applied at B. We're all good. Any questions? Next, I want to look at the displacement at B. So I go to the deformation probe at B. And here is the how B is going to move. B is going to move. Point zero zero five 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 nine inches. So as the uh, probe is giving some weird error saying invalid, the result of the Which probe are you trying to add? Um, the force reaction and the deformation probe. When you go to add the force reaction, please make sure you do not change the location method. Oh. Keep it as boundary condition. Maybe you selected by geometry. Is this showing boundary condition? Okay, are you able to select fixed support? Uh, yeah. Okay. Are you able to get an answer? When you go to the deformation probe, you want to select by geometry. Okay, let's keep going for the uh, interest of time and I'll be happy to look at your specific model should you have a, a problem there. So we looked at the war reaction and the displacement at B. Uh, next, I wanna look at the axial forces and look at this. What is this showing? It is showing that AB is all in red a two force member in tension and look at BC, it's all in blue, which is negative. So it's all in compression. If I go to the total bending moment, I don't have any bending moment. Torsional moment, all zero. Shear forces, all zero. Isn't that what we expected? Let me show you one more thing, which is finding the stresses in AB and BC. So I'm gonna go to solution. 
and I'm going to go to toolbox. And I'm going to choose the beam tool. When I select the beam tool, it added the beam tool to my outline under solution. If I expand my beam tool, it is showing direct stress and a combined stress. I can also right click on it and go insert beam tool, stress, and add a maximum bending. So now I'm looking at a bending, a combined, and a direct. Okay, I go to solution. And now you can see beam tool. So now I'm looking at a direct stress and a bending stress and a combined stress. But before we do any solution, I would like you to understand what is meant by these types of stresses. Sorry for that. So we are looking at three different types of stresses. Direct stress, bending stress, and combined stress. Please keep in mind that all these types of stresses are axial 
for normal stresses. So this is normal for axial stresses. The direct stress is a result of a normal force. Or an axial force. And uh, if you recall, if we have an axial loaded member and it's subject to or exposed to a normal force, then if I look at the stress distribution, this is the resultant of this stress distribution. So we have this uh, uniform. So this is where sigma is equal to n over a. A bending stress is when I have a beam subject to a bending moment. As a result of that, I still get a sigma, but it's equal to m over i times y. That's the bending stress. And a bending stress has a maximum and a minimum. In this case, the maximum is at the bottom, tension. It goes to zero at the neutral axis. And on the top, I have a negative stress compression. So you see there is a max and there is a minimum. So this is from N, this is from M. <clears throat> So this bending stress is clearly from the bending moment. A combined, as the name imply, is when we take both of them, so the N plus the M. So the total sigma here would be a combination of these two. And uh, when I look at this, if I have a cross section, that is subject to both N and M. I'm gonna end up getting maybe something like this. I still have a max and I still have a minimum. So the combined Sigma would be N over A plus or minus M over I times Y. This is so that we know what we are looking at. Oh, is anyone still writing? So I go back to ANSYS workbench. And uh, when we solve for these stresses, a quick solve here, the really one we look, want to look at for this problem is the direct stress. And you can see again, I have in red, 5,559 PSI. In blue, I have minus 2,965.9, which is compression. So these are the stresses in AB and in BC. So we were able to achieve everything we did by hand uses ANSYS workbench. I would like you to do the same with homework number five to make sure that you're able to solve the problem you did by hand using ANSYS workbench. It is best to take this while it's still fresh and go apply it to your homework. Any questions? So on Thursday, we're gonna have our quiz and we're going to continue working with ANSYS workbench. I'll see you all on Thursday. Thank you. Oh, remember to save at your work at the end. So I want to save and I can uh, export to create an archive. So now I'm so saving my project. And I can go to file and go archive and create a WBPZ. 
archive. Were, uh, were you able to figure out what was going on? Oh, yeah. We were good. It, it was some weird thing where the. Um, okay, don't figure it out. Okay. Thank you. 